right, we're going to reconvene our meeting and shift gears to a walkthrough of H812, an act relating to threatened endangered species. Um, I would like to give Representative Sackowitz an opportunity to introduce it, although um, it's just now rejoining us. Oh, he made it. <laughs> um, and I would say that this bill got my attention because all of the members of this committee signed on to it. So I thought it would be worth understanding why Representative Sackowitz introduced it and walking through it with Legislative Council. So we're ready, um, Representative Sackowitz, when you are. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, given the worldwide biodiversity crisis, uh, it seemed like it might be a nice time to look at our endangered species statutes. And so after, you know, a, 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 a not very deep dive into the statutes, um, I found um, a handful of items which I thought could be updated. And um, just very briefly, um, the ones which I think are the most, um, <laughs> most significant are um, right now the, um, the state does not need to update that list within any particular amount of time. And so this bill would um, require the state to update the list at least once every three years. Um, currently, the state does not have to um, find critical habitat for a particular species. Uh, it, it may do so, but it, this bill would change that to a shall um, do so. Um, currently, there's a um, significant list of exceptions that would allow people to take endangered species, um, some of which um, don't really seem necessary, in my opinion. And so um, this bill would um, curtail that list to um, really just um, actions that would um, potentially enhance the propagation or survival of the species. <clears throat> and the, the last big thing that this bill would do is um, currently the state gives a very wide latitude to farming and forestry operations to take endangered species. And this bill would um, require the Agency of Natural Resources to create um, rules around the taking of these species to give them some more protection. Representative Smith. I have a question. Thank you for this bill, I think. Uh, does, if, if they review it every two years, can they add and take off I, to this list? I, I believe that is the case, yes. Right. Yep. You think it is. Michael, that's my answer a question oh, like that. Okay. Yep. They, they do it by rule. Uh, and so they have added and subtracted. Good. Thank you. Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the other thing you mentioned on, on, like on the farmland, so if there's an endangered species on farmland, mm -hmm. would, would like an ANR could remove it from that farmland and not have the, the the farmer be like responsible for plotting off a certain area for these to live? Um, potentially, I think that would be <clears throat> what the rules would end up describing. We'll talk about that. Anyway. Okay, that's just a concern. Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, as Representative Sackwitz just stated, the, the bill makes multiple amendments to the threatened environment and, and endangered species chapter in law. Section 1, 10 BSA 5402, there is a requirement that ANR list all the threatened and endangered species in the state. Part of that list is everything that's designated federal. So everything designated federally endangered becomes uh, a federally threatened and endangered species in, in Vermont. Um, and then the state can add to that list for those, those species that are threatened and endangered in Vermont, but maybe not. <clears throat> there is no directive for the agency to do that uh, on any particular timeline. So this would require them to, to do that on a three-year timeline. Um, that's the first major change in the bill. The second major change relates to um, the designation of critical habitat. So, so critical habitat, uh, let me define that for you, um, means a 
delineated location within a geographical area occupied by a species that has the physical or biological features that are identifiable, concentrated, and decisive for the survival of a population and was necessary for conservation or recovery of the species and may require special management considerations or protect, protection. So that's what critical habitat is. The agency currently is not required to designate critical habitat for any species. And you will see that provision on page three, lines two and three. And that is being struck, the language that the secretary shall not be required to designate critical habitat for every state listed species is being struck. And instead, on page two, it provides that the secretary shall adopt or amend by rule a critical habitat designation list for each threatened or endangered species. That doesn't mean that everywhere that a threatened or endangered species is located will be designated critical habitat. It's areas that are necessary for their survival will be designated. And it doesn't mean that the, the, the agency has to designate every area that's, that is used by a, a species as critical habitat. It's those certain areas that are critical for the proliferation of the species. And so there would be a designation for every one of the listed threatened and endangered species. Is there a threshold that automatically makes a species uh, eligible for being endangered and threatened? Uh, no, there isn't. Well, there's um, there's criteria. Um, the secretary shall determine a species to be endangered if it normally occurs in the state and its continued existence <laughs> as a sustainable component of the state's wildlife or wild plants is in jeopardy. The secretary shall determine a species to be threatened if it is a sustainable component of the state's wildlife or plants, it is reasonable to conclude based on available information that its numbers are declining and unless protected, it will become an endangered species. And then there are further considerations, but there are nine subdivisions long. So it does. Is that a Do we have a list in the state of species that are not threatened by like climate change? that are expected to be just fine? That are not threatened by climate change? Not that I am aware of. We could make a list of our yeah. best guesses. I mean, I just, it yeah, just, a good question. yeah, it occurs to me this, this could be yeah. the MS. Well, they're protected. Should I move on? So Representative Sackwitz referenced uh, a, a kind of an interesting component of the threatened and endangered species law, which is also a component of the wetlands law, is that no rule adopted by a &R underneath this chapter can have an undue interference with farming or forestry operations or accepted silvicultural practices. And a &R shall not adopt rules that affect far farming, forestry operation, or accepted um, silvicultural practices. So the first reference, so the first change to that is on page two, line 19, in a &R's adoption of critical habitat, it doesn't have to consult with the agency of ag or the Department of Forests and Parks in the designation of critical habitat. It will be solely based on the a and on a and R's um, consideration of the of the criteria for critical habitat. <clears throat> However, on page three, they'll still consult with the Agency of Ag and Forests and Parks in determining where to designate critical habitat, not whether or not it's needed, but where it should be located. So no longer consulting with the Agency of Ag and Forests and Parks about whether it's needed, but they continue to consult where it should be located. I mean, right now the statute says they're going to consult consult with AAFM for any species, not just ones that are found on for, for anything that could affect farming. 
Yes, they have to be consulted. Anything that could affect. Do you know how that's been applied? Uh, yeah, there's. it's often a kind of a, a prolonged and difficult process to get to uh, a rule that the affected agencies will agree to. Representative Pat. It's this is just a kind of wordsmithing. I just was noticing uh, in terms of consulting, uh, the agency of uh, the Department of Forests and Parks is part of the Agency of Natural Resources. Agriculture is not. Um, so you're you're asked you're. I agree. They should, I would hope they would consult uh, with for, with Forests and Parks, but they the the Secretary of A and R is the commissioner's uh, boss uh, in terms of uh, the organization itself. I, I wonder whether is there just a slightly different way to work. So the rest of that section is conforming changes, changing whether habitat is designated to when or where it's designated. So that, that's the rest of, of section two. Section three relates to um, the prohibition on taking of a threatened and endangered species. Right now, um, there are specific prohibitions on what you can do or how you can do something to a threatened and endangered species. You can't take, possess, or transport wildlife or wildlife or wild plants that are threatened or endangered. You can't destroy or adversely impact critical habitat. And then on page six, there's three new subdivisions. A couple of them are a bit of bootstrapping, but it's also something that you might want to include because of their clarity and transparency. Because right now on page five, line 18, you'll see that a person can't possess a threatened or endangered species. The way that possess is defined in statute and it includes selling and transporting and importing. So that's, that's not really clear that possess means to sell. Um, or not to sell. And so on page six, you'll see a clear prohibition on the sell, sale or offer for sale in intrastate commerce within Vermont of a threatened or endangered species. And then you'll see page six, line three, you can't deliver, receive, transport, or ship a threatened or endangered species intrastate. And you can't import a threatened or endangered species into um, uh, into Vermont. Now, the Federal Endangered Species Act, implemented and enforced by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, they already prohibit the interstate importation or sale of a federally listed species. So why would you need number five to import a threatened or endangered because there are state listed species that are not on the federal list. So that is why five is there. It might look duplicative of the federal ESA, but it is not because it incorporates those state listed species, uh, not just the federally listed species. So that's, that's, that's an important thing to remember. There are federal prohibitions on transport of federally listed species across state lines or across national, you know, international lines. There's this whole thing called CITES where that's incorporated into the Federal Endangered Species Act. But Vermont is going to regulate itself. It's interstate movement, it's interstate sale and the, the importation or sale into the state of the state listed species. That makes sense to everyone. Okay. So moving on to section four, as Representative Sack was referenced earlier, there are authorized or, or activities that are currently authorized where a person can apply to the Secretary of AR and get a permit to take that species. To and taking means many things. It means to kill it, uh, but it, it also means to capture it uh, and to keep it and to study it. And so right now, 
you can take that animal for scientific purposes to enhance the propagation or survival of a species for zoological exhibition, for educational purposes, for non-commercial cultural or ceremonial purposes, or for special purposes consistent with the purposes of the Federal Endangered Species Act. So let's talk about a couple of these. So what the, the proposed change would be would to limit those authorized takings to only to enhancement of the propagation or survival of a threatened or endangered species. The Federal Endangered Species Act has the same, same authority. You can take an animal for this purpose. They call this authority the recovery authority. It's when you need to approve a taking, the capturing or the killing, or et cetera, of that animal to basically allow for its recovery. Say it's disease and there's a disease outbreak in, in a population of threatened or endangered species, then you're authorized to take that animal. Say you need to study that animal for some purpose. You can, <laughs> underneath this authority, you can take that animal, capture it, study it in order to enhance its propagation or survival. You are not just going to be allowed to take it, to study it, to see some other scientific purpose besides its propagation or survival. And it's not gonna be allowed for zoological exhibition. There is the non-commercial cultural or ceremonial purposes. Now this is a little complicated because there are federal laws that allow recognized Native American tribes and recognized Native American religions to take certain parts of threatened or endangered species for the purposes of their ceremonial um, rights. And, and it usually relates to birds of prey, um, certain eagles, their feathers. Um, those federal laws have preemption provisions in them. So the, those rights or recognized tribes in Vermont would still receive that protection under federal law. But it's something you want to think about considering that the tribes in Vermont are not all federally recognized. So if you want to allow those tribes to use certain feathers and other parts for their, for their ceremonies, then you might want to think about clarifying that provision. Um, there's also something called an incidental take. It's when you don't know for sure that you're gonna take the animal, but there's a reasonable probability that you will. Um, and that remains largely unchanged. Um, so the, when you know you're gonna take the animal would change, when you don't know, but there's a probability, you can still get the incidental take permit. <laughs> That brings you to page eight, line five. This is the language about interference with agricultural or silvicultural practices. So currently, no threatened or endangered species rule shall cause undue interference with farming, forestry operations, or accepted silvicultural practices. And that leads to negotiations between the, the relevant departments and agencies about what a T&E rule will look like. So instead of having that limitation, what the bill proposes is that the Secretary of A&R, after consultation with the agency of ag, shall develop by rule practices that a person engaged in forest, farming, forestry, or accepted silvicultural practices may implement to avoid or minimize the taking of a threatened or endangered species, and that encourage critical habitat for threatened or endangered species. So Representative Clifford, person's farming and they know that there's a certain area of wetland on their farm or a certain area of, of uh, vegetation that has threatened or endangered species. They could work within these rules um, that the agency sets to basically protect and preserve that area so that it doesn't have an impact on the species or that critical habitat. And if they do that, and there is in fact a taking of that animal, 
or plant on page eight, line 15, they will receive a rebuttable presumption that they did not cause the taking. Because if they're complying with the rule to preserve or protect that, that species, and for some reason there is a taking of that animal, not by the person, they'll have a rebuttable presumption that they did not cause them. So these rules kind of flip the current practice of instead of the agency of ag having to agree what the rule is going to be in the threatened and endangered species rule so there is no undue interference, the agency of natural resources says, do this and you will get the, the presumption that you did not create the taking of that or plant. Oh. Yeah. So, but can the ANR take that if it's a, if it's a, if the, if the say the farmer uh, does not do that because of whatever circumstances, can the secretary, uh, can ANR do that? Can they take, take it or you know, if it's a, like a nuisance for the farmer? And it might, it might not getting that clear, but can the can the ANR issue them like they to take it or move it? So only to enhance the propagation or survival of the species, because right. right. A and R is subject to that same restriction on what they can take than any that any other member of the public is. Okay. So if if there was a need to move it or or okay to do some other conservation where they could authorize okay. that. Thank you. And then the, the last change is on page nine. Um, it's in the general permit authority, uh, lines 14 through 15, that the secretary has approved best management practices to minimize the greatest extent possible the taking. Well, that's what they're going to do in that rule. They don't need to include in the, the general permit anymore these BMPs. That's what the rule is going to do. And so you don't need duplicative references to that. Uh, the act takes effect on July 1, 2024. You probably have to think about that because they have to adopt a rule. You might want to basically base in some of these um, because of, you know, just it's going to take time to do some of these things. Like designating critical habitat for every species, you probably want to like give a general schedule for when that's going to be done. All right. Members have questions, Representative Morris. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's just, uh, I, we went through this earlier and I was trying to think about it and, and I wanted to ask when we were on this point, but the critical, listing the critical habitat or identifying where that is. We've taken out their, the former restriction where the secretary shall not be required to designate critical, critical habitat for every state listed threatened or endangered species. So now they're gonna to have to. How, how does that work with an elusive animal that, they don't have a specific territory. And I hate to say the word catamount, but uh, if there is such a thing and has been, how would they identify? I don't believe the catamount is listed anymore. I think the catamount was removed from the last, uh, a, a few years ago. There are catamount. So uh, <laughs> then something that, that we do have, it could be a, a, the moose population we keep hearing where it's diminishing or being, uh, they, they may come to a point where they call that a, or, or, uh, an endangered species in Vermont. What, how, would they, how would they determine where that critical habitat is? Or? Well, if it's really rare and, and elusive, as you said, but they have identified it, they generally have an idea where it is. And <clears throat> the best example I have of that are, are the timber rattlesnakes that are, that are in Vermont. And they don't tell anybody where they are. It's a general idea where they are, but they don't tell. Them. And okay. they, they have designated that as critical habitat. All right. So that's my point is this is not going to cause any undue 
it, it there might be some like I can't remember the the one bumblebee that they're really sure is going to go endangered. I don't know if they could. I don't know if they know where it is anymore. That's that's right. Um, that might be something you consider and talk to the department about the agency. Thank you for all of that. Walking us through bills. I'm going to shift gears one more time, committee to money. Yeah, be safe. Have a good dinner for any leftovers you know. Super. Um, next up, we're going to get just Representative Tory went to the Ways and Means Committee last week to listen in on a conversation about fee report from the Agency of Natural Resources. So I thought it'd be good for us to hear how that went. It was very enlightening. <laughs> I've actually never been in ways and means before. But, um, yes, Julie Moore was there, Secretary General. And um, big budget AR has um, fiscal year 25, it's expected to be 292 million, um, which is 26 above the current year due to increased Fed funds. Uh, but in terms of fees, I guess it's been eight years that we've had a fee bills. So it was good to hear, like, how many fees are there in AMR? Um, so I learned that, you know, they have um, permit fund, they have um, special funds at DEC, they have parks funds um, that include ski resorts, resort areas, um, fish and wildlife, and um, Forest Parks and Rec, DEC has 300 fees. That was the most, um, which includes dams and safety. And the fewest, I think, were in uh, maybe the parks. And um, so, you know, some good questions got asked about when were they last changed at a &R and um, it looks like in 2017, after the PUC's net metering, um, they had to do some updates then. And, um, you know, some trends, are there any trends with fee amounts going up or down? And, um, so it looks like fish and wildlife fees are starting to drop because of fewer people hunting fishing. Also maybe more people buy the lifetime life pieces. So that kind of affects fees. Um, so, you know, a pretty straightforward question got asked as far as like, um, you know, what would be involved? How would you approach a fee bill? And, um, you know, there's, according to the secretary, there's no simple equitable approach to changing fees. She used the term, some are elastic and some are inelastic. Um, and let's see what some other highlights here. Um, Did anyone from Ways and Means talk about how we used to do fee bill change adjustments? No. It was very methodical and um, well done. Yeah. yeah. It was very rational. Hmm. Yeah. So there's a three year rotation that every agency would go through. So last year, it was the transportation committee, right? Yeah. Well, we haven't had a fee bill in eight years, but we but some fees. chose to raise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess Chair Kornheiser uh, said that they'll be deciding this week. Whether to, but ANR's fee, to, whether to do a fee bill. So we don't have to wait very long. <laughs> Top of mind over there, I guess. Great. Thanks for that. Sure. And Representative Stebbins went to the Appropriations Committee on our behalf um, to hear about budget adjustment. I just ask one question if we might write that in the past, 
with the bills, the agency would actually come in with a proposed bill. Yeah, they would and generate the them. Is look at it's happened since we haven't had one in eight years and what happened last year, it's the community just had to do it itself. Do it, yeah. yeah, okay. And that's what we we'll started. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> So um, I put together a handout uh, to give a summary of what is being proposed um, in the governor's recommended um, budget adjustment act. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who haven't like spent time in a money committee, they get two parts. They get this spreadsheet. Um, and this is posted. Oh. They get this spreadsheet, and then there's this um, narrative that goes with it. Um, in some, yeah. in some, there are like six or seven proposed changes, of which, um, at this point, uh, it, it seems like. Uh, well, I'll go through them. Um, they all seem pretty reasonable, but the way my brain works is I, I prefer to actually understand what we're talking about. So hence why you have this table. So the first item, um, fish and wildlife, uh, it adds 655,000 for a pay class upgrade um, from a mixture of different funds, uh, general funds, special funds, and some federal funds. Um, this is essentially to uh, you know, upgrade a pay class uh, for various staff in fish and wildlife. Uh, and maybe just in terms of process, I can go through them all and give a summary. Um, the next one is... Uh, What's a pay class upgrade? I would imagine it's probably keeping uh, up with cost of living. I, I was not able to go to approach, so I listened. Um, and while there were questions asked, uh, there weren't, I mean, there wasn't that. So I can follow up if that's helpful or. Okay. There, there are a lot of little questions that I don't have answers to, as you might imagine. But... Yeah. Representative Sibelia. So uh, I'm wondering about uh, if there was a total amount of fees raised that was discussed. Fees? In ways and means. So I'm, I'm looking at this and going, okay, this is a pay class upgrade. And they're we're cobbling together funding here for this. Where is it going to come in the future? <laughs> yeah. Right. Why are we? Yeah. So is there I, any cross pollinating? Were there, were there total amount of fees being considered, discussed? And you're specifically interested in solid waste? This no, this is fish and wildlife. Just oh, fish and wildlife. Is it just fish and wildlife it's in this in particular? In this instance, um, it's maybe because they're. Oh, well, maybe they're no. So this is not. I mean, this is Gabrielle working on this from eleven to one this morning. Um, so let me see if it's A and R or if it's just fish and wildlife because maybe that's incorrect. One minute. Oh, it's not. No, it's, 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 it is like, fish and wildlife. I thought it was not. Okay. It's fish and wildlife it's just fish only, fish. and it's 655000 And as a caveat, so we have, you know, the Budget Adjustment Act um, where we can write a letter with our general comments, but we also have the budget, which, you know, so we could tee things up if there are concerns like we're proposing a pay class upgrade, which, uh, you know, but then we may or may not be you know, we, we haven't had a fee bill in eight years. So we can put some of those high level comments in our letter back to approps for the BAA um, without necessarily saying, we think it should be X because we do have another bite of the apple. And just for high level, when do they want to hear back from us? Oh, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I mean, they have to present on Friday. Right, they're doing it this week. So, so yeah, we should, um, let's keep going. So that just looking for high level concerns. So uh, recognizing, um, so that's something that I could put into a draft letter that everyone could skim tomorrow morning. Um, but basically, uh, to your comment about, you know, pay class upgrade, are we going to have a fee bill? Something like that. Yeah, I can add just um, my notes that um, 
They have 100, and different, 100 different trees at Fish and Wildlife, and that comprises a third of their budget. Okay. But I don't know what budget dollar is. Um, I wonder what the intent is of not allowing fees to be raised in Fish and Wildlife, or if we're trying to get rid of that department. We haven't raised them at the whole agency. Which costs all of government. Get rid of all government. All right. <laughs> uh, so next, uh, there. This is related to PCB testing program in schools. An increase in the number of schools above the original estimate, and the addition of a building materials survey, which is used to define the number of indoor air samples that need to be collected, have resulted in an increase to the overall budget. So there is a proposed transfer of three and a half million from the Solid Waste Management Assistance Account of the Waste Management Assistance Fund to the Environmental Contingency Fund for the PCV testing program. This transfer represents the additional amount needed to ensure testing in schools scheduled for sampling through July, 2025. Failure to provide these funds will result in schools being responsible for testing per Act 74 of 2021 without state financial support. So when I read something like this, generally, just so you know, it comes from the governor's um, explanation. Um, if I recall correctly, someone asked, so what is, what is not gonna be paid for? Or like, what is the impact to the waste management mm -hmm. program? And if I recall correctly, I have to double check um, my notes, but it, it was not necessarily articulated in a pointed way as to what would be what we not fund. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, public service department, um, after the July floods, uh, the emergency board uh, pulled 20 million from the general fund that had been set aside for the public service department uh, to set up the Business Emergency Gap Assistance Program. When the Emergency Board approved this transfer, they also included a requirement that the Commissioner of Finance and Management present a plan to replenish the spending authority for the PSD in the fiscal year 24 uh, Budget Adjustment Act. So that's this plan. Um, essentially, it's refilling the 20 million that had been earmarked by the PSD for broadband funding. Um, so it's taking it from the general fund uh, to make sure that we fill that gap um, that we shifted from the public service department to go to businesses after flooding. Next, we have uh, DEC within ANR. Um, this is adding $165,000 to continue with the assessment regarding the Green River Reservoir. So we initially appropriated $350,000. Um, the additional 165,000 is for an analysis to evaluate structural stability, hydraulic adequacy, risk valuation of the infrastructure and alternative uses. And this is a one-time funding. The 350 didn't include those things? Okay, so question. It's a little suspect. So, so this is to evaluate. Uh, there's been talk and discussion since it doesn't make sense for the Morrisville Electric to operate this dam and, uh, under environmental restrictions uh, that the state should take it over to preserve the reservoir and, and all everything that means. So this is an assessment towards that end. What what would be in what would the cost be to the state? Okay, thank you. Well, it's it's additional if funding they, they, for the initial assessment that okay, is still ongoing. Okay, but so it's, it's were they to do that, what would be involved and in what are we getting ourselves into? Okay, that's my understanding okay. from speaking with my house approach peer. Thanks. Did anyone ask what the original scope was? Is scope expansion or this is just more expensive than we estimated? Uh, I don't think anyone asked that. It's a state facility. Morrisville Power and Light do right now. Question is, should the state, and if they do, keep it? So it's this assessment to help determine whether the state should. That's the purpose. Yes. Buy it. Over, buy it. 
Okay. <clears throat> so next we have uh, taking one hundred twenty thousand three hundred dollars from the general fund to go to the Act Two Hundred and Fifty Permit Fund. So um, I don't know if you recall when we had um, Savannah Haskell here. She mentioned that there was a small gap in their budget. Um, uh, S100 that we passed last year um, provided some exemptions related to utility and housing costs permits, um, and it resulted in $120,300 from their $120,300. Uh, so essentially this is filling that gap um, as a result of that particular bill. Uh, so three years ago, the next line item D.101, little c, number five. Um, the next one is that apparently three years ago, uh, $100,000 was given uh, to the agency or transferred, I don't, I don't know which one it was, to the agency of administration to do an audit of the clean water fund. Oh no, we don't have thanks. Sorry. Um, apparently, no one responded to the RFP, so the funds are now going back <laughs> to the clean water fund. Uh, and if the next question is, so does that mean we just didn't do the audit? I was not in committee. I do not know. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next two items, uh, so this is related to timing of some bond uh, issues and issuances. Um, there are two funds. There's a protection projects fund, and then also a natural resources projects fund that the timing of the bond uh, essentially meant that um, 1.18 million was pulled from the Protection Projects Fund and 2.12 million was pulled from the Natural Resources Projects Fund. So both of these uh, are being um, you know, brought back up to the original uh, fund level, I guess, uh, via the general fund for both of those. And then if you flip over, um, in this narrative piece that accompanies the Excel spreadsheet, uh, there are a couple language changes that don't appear in the spreadsheet because they're not necessarily numerical, but they do have policy impl implications. So one uh, relates to the conversation that we had last year relating to Brownfields reuse and Environmental Liability and Limitation Act. If you recall, we, we discussed a lot um, how you know, there was there was a discussion about geographic diversity, making sure we provided support to different locations across the state. Uh, the suggested language change here is to uh, remove the cap on the number of brownfields for consideration. So rather than having it read, funds shall be used for the assessment and cleanup planning for a maximum of 25 brownfield sites. Uh, the governor's recommend has language that says funds shall be used for assessment and cleanup planning of brownfield sites. And then lastly, uh, I believe uh, Sabina Haskell also mentioned this, um, that there were proposals to the NRB uh, in which people were um, perhaps presenting multiple um, projects uh, as one permit application fee. So um, there are two or three paragraphs, and I only rewrote one example. Uh, there are two or three paragraphs that articulate that the fee applies to each individual permit or each individual permit application to make it um, more clear that if you're filing a permit application, you pay a fee for each one. Uh, and I have that in more full language if it's helpful. Any questions? Do <clears throat> um, you remember why we had cap 25 on the ground fields? Did anyone ask that? Okay. 
And then I'm just on the on the back side, you listed the agency um, or division, I guess, or department, yes. but these last three don't have that and they're not all NRB. Um, and so uh, this is the agency of administration, the next one, I guess. You mean the back page? On your, well, your front page. Oh. Um, well, bottom three don't say which department. It, yeah. <clears throat> so this is one of the things that I, I mean, I spent two years in bus transportation, so I saw a lot of this, but I never quite figured out when something made it here, but they didn't make it here, or when something made it here and it didn't make it here. So these items, um, those three items at the bottom of the table on page one are listed in this, but not in the two, but not in this. So, and I, I think the, I think the background is because it's essentially a transfer. Uh, so it's not really a revenue impact. So it's not necessarily a budget impact. At least that's the most that I can explain it. And I could be explaining it incorrectly. Okay. Uh, no uh, recollection, I think, on the Brownfield sites. <laughs> I think we were trying to prevent them from getting coupled up in one or two uses, but we may have gone That's right. yeah. but too far yeah. with 25 and maybe we've you now. No, but what they want to do is go further. Go further. Yeah. So well, if they have 40 projects that they could give they do now $200,000 yeah. to or whatever. Although this also would have the effect of allowing it all to go to max. Right, this is pretty broad flexibility. Do you know how much money is left in there? No, um, and that's why I was thinking maybe, I mean, appropriations hasn't raised any particular flags um, in my conversations with them, um, but more of a general, you know, uh, what we had talked about last year, um, you know, the Clean Water Fund or uh, what we just heard about BHCB or, you know, ha, ha, what is the plan for, um, you know, in the, in the budget proposal? Um, are we going, how are we going to make sure that these various uh, funds are, you know, uh, either upheld or supported um, and to call out some general, like, okay, so I'm just throwing this out there. We support this. We're okay with this. I mean, you can say you support it. You can say you're, you don't support it, and here's why. Or you can say we're neutral. Um, so we could say we support it. Uh, we have these general concerns, which is, you know, we're talking about a pay class upgrade, but we don't know if there's going to be a fee bill proposal. Um, we could also say, uh, you know, we're okay with the solid waste management transfer, but it does make us wonder what's not being done um, for the budget. We'd really like to understand if you've made proposals like this that you articulate what's not being done and what we're kicking, you know, what ball we're kicking down the yeah. road. So we can have sort of a generic letter like that. <clears throat> that sounds pretty specific and good on things we've brought up. Love it if you're able to do that. Okay. And don't overdo it. And no, I won't. Keep it simple. Yes. Don't, don't stay up till one doing this. That was last year. Okay. <laughs> I might do that for the budget. Representative Pat. I mean, I, there's nothing in here that jumps out at me. Like, oh no, that, you know, they, what are they doing that can? There's nothing like that from a policy or, you know, significant spending level, but there are some. Some questions about what if 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 you do this. I mean, I fully understand it happens all the time. The borrowing from one fund, and and it's a good thing when they repay it. <laughs> um, uh, but but uh, I, I, no, nothing's jumping out of me as like how, what are they what are they that they're somehow setting uh, policy or eliminating programs or anything like that. You're, but those are those are good questions. I think we could we can ask it a at a high level. Yeah, I would just um, note in the PSD section that um, I believe it should say anticipate receiving a large federal grant. Uh, 
Sure, I can change that. I probably should have written draft on this document, but. Consider it done. Thank you. All right, members, I think that completes our work for the day. So with that, we will adjourn.